Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our weekly CEO desktop chat. Uh, thank you for joining us as we give you an update on a number of key issues that the organization is um, looking into and, and facing as a result of our COVID-19 uh, pandemic preparations, but also looking at restoration work and a number of other issues. So we have, uh, again, a wonderful group of panelists here to speak with you. Um, we will allow them to introduce themselves before we have Del Vecchio actually start with his comments. Um, just a point of order, uh, if you have questions you would like for us to address, please submit them uh, on by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen, write in your questions, and we will address them at the end of the group's comments. Uh, so with that, uh, introduce myself and then have the panelists do the same. My name is Terry Lightfoot. I am the Public Affairs Director. Uh, yes, that's right. I am the Director of Public <laughs> Affairs and Community Engagement uh, for Alameda Health System, or you can call me whatever you want. Um, but uh, thank you for being here, and I will start at my top left with uh, Janet. Can you begin introductions? Hi, I'm Janet McKinnis. I'm the Chief Nurse Executive, Chief Administrative Officer. Uh, Rick Kibler, uh, Chief Compliance Officer. Felicia Tornabeni, Associate Chief Medical Officer. Hey there, good afternoon. Tom Ver Hussein, Chief Quality Officer. And I think uh, Terry's uh, comment is a reflection of when we work so closely together, sometimes our roles just all meld together as one. So uh, oh, good to Thank see you guys this afternoon. <laughs> uh, and I'm Terry Reverend, the Chief Human Resources Officer. Is that everyone? It's everyone. Yes, sir. Oh, that was quick. Great. Okay, cool. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, actually, I'm getting a little feedback. Hang on just a second. It's very weird. <laughs> so sorry about that. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope everyone is doing well. Great as always to see you and uh, or to be with you. Uh, uh, virtually along with a, a panel of um, um, outstanding content experts uh, who will do our very best to uh, provide you with timely updates of what's happening in our organization, uh, in our community as best we can understand it and keep track of it, and also to provide you with um, um, the best answers we have for the uh, wonderful questions that you asked that uh, keep us um, uh, very much in tune with uh, um, um, the communication or the pulse of the communication throughout the organization. So thank you for joining us. Um, as we move into restoration and recovery, we've been doing that for about two weeks now, but also uh, really um, continue to, to, to be mindful of everything around us. But in this stage, I want to take a minute to acknowledge um, uh, this journey that we've, we've, we've taken and we continue to take to respond to the pandemic. Uh, it's been an unprecedented time across our globe and the toll it has taken on our communities, our families, and individually can, and in, in many cases has been, or often has been overwhelming. Uh, in honor of National Mental Health Awareness Month, um, I want to take a moment to give a shout out to all of you who work so tirelessly to positively impact the mental health of our patients and of our fellow coworkers. Uh, all across the system, whether it's at John George or in our acute facilities, in our ambulatory clinics, in our post-acute settings, your dedication and your commitment to the mental health uh, and well-being of some of our most vulnerable patients is incredible. And thank you, thank you, thank you for your compassion and your resilience as we move forward together. Uh, I'm going to share a few updates today in a couple of areas. So I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, supplies and other personal protective equipment, talk to you about patient and employee safety. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Joint Commission survey readiness, um, a very important uh, topic that we continue to monitor and to uh, prepare and respond to over the past uh, couple of weeks. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about fiscal implications uh, for COVID-19 and just the organization's uh, finances as that has been understandably a, uh, a subject of uh, Q&A over the past couple of weeks and I committed to bringing you some update there. And then uh, I want to reference some of the wonderful community support that we continue to receive and I'll end with my normal self-care and wellness uh, pieces. So let's talk a little bit about supplies. Uh, we are taking a very systematic approach to restoring services to ensure that we do not put ourselves in a position that compromises the safety of our patients and of our employees. 
Uh, having sufficient PPE and supplies is crucial in our efforts to restore services. And as hospitals nationwide begin to ramp up delayed services, the acquisition of supplies will be an ongoing challenge. We continue to closely monitor and track our supply procurement and our use usage, as uh, well as guidance coming from our local health authorities. The PBE dashboard uh, that you see that we're updating once a week is usually updated on Wednesdays. And uh, this week, we made the decision that we'll now uh, change that updating to every Tuesday so as to be able to speak to the status of those things on this call Wednesday, as well as our subsequent update that comes out uh, uh, on, on Wednesday evenings. The supply chains continue to be strained, and we are still working through our supply sourcing and challenges and disruptions. A lot of our uh, vendors still have us on what's referred to as allocation, which means that they are trying to uh, um, distribute in a, a equitable fashion available supplies in the market across the market. So often we and other providers don't get everything that we request and or would like to have uh, during this time period. It's crucial that we recognize the importance uh, to continue to follow PPE guidance and preservation as we strategize to conserve and manage our supply of PPE. This past week, uh, many of you learned uh, that uh, the isolation gowns that we have in the organization were depleted and uh, were moved to the status level of red uh, during last week's update. That means that we're experiencing a lower than needed supply of our uh, uh, routine or traditional source of isolation gowns. Now to address this shortage, we introduced two new types of gowns into our supply chain and requested stock from a strategic national stockpile. Uh, last Thursday, we, uh, so, so with respect specifically to the gowns, we uh, made provisions for using an alternative method of, or an alternative type of gowns and methodology uh, for our staff, and that's been uh, met with mixed reviews. We're being very sensitive to those, uh, that feedback uh, as a means to make sure that we're providing uh, the, the gowns that you need and in a, uh, in a manner that works for providing uh, safety for staff and for patients. So we'll continue to look at that. And as I mentioned, we're looking at our supply chain. We've made orders and we're expecting delivery of that in the coming weeks. So we're waiting on those. We're also looking at other uh, sources, of, uh, potential sources to see if we can get things even faster for the organization. Uh, the gowns are, as uh, our PPE uh, goes, uh, one of the um, uh, principal areas of concern where everything else is pretty much in a, a good shape at this point. Uh, as you know, and we talked last week, uh, um, last Thursday, we began a pilot to process sterilizing N95 respirators in our ICUs and step-down units at the Highland uh, location. Strict infection prevention protocols are in place uh, to ensure that the sterilized respirators will be kept in a reserve stock and they'll only be deployed should we need additional supplies. I want to be clear and reiterate that because there appear to be a bit of confusion around it. We are not using the uh, sterilized uh, N95 um, um, respirators at this stage. We are now securing the, the inventory and sterilizing them and uh, preserving them in the event that we would need to use them if we were to experience a surge or any other uh, compromise to our, our um, N95 mask inventory. But right now we are okay. Uh, once we review and vet this process, uh, we'll begin to roll out the uh, recycling process to other locations. Please uh, check with your staff, and your, I'm sorry, your managers and others if you have any questions about that process uh, or any concerns about it that we could address for you. Turning now to patient and employee safety. Uh, today, for the first time, the number of COVID-19 uh, cases in Alameda County has exceeded that of Santa Clara County. Uh, and um, which has been in the lead for most of uh, the Bay Area. As we see the easing of health orders throughout our community, uh, sort of the relaxation of some of these shelter in place restrictions, it's important that we continue to be vigilant. COVID-19 continues to spread in our communities and a vaccine is not yet currently available. Uh, if we're not uh, careful, a surge could be uh, um, closer around the corner than, than we had otherwise anticipated. It's important as an organization and as individuals that we continue to stay up to date on the latest guidance as we respond to uh, this uh, pandemic. Now our turn uh, to talk a little bit about the other priority for the organization and that is our Joint Commission Survey Readiness. As I hope and I, uh, I'm confident that many of you are aware, three of our facilities, primarily our core, namely Highland Hospital, San Leandro Hospital and John George, were surveyed by the Joint Commission this past February. We're expecting a return visit as early as uh, this June, uh, so starting next week. 
Our teams, many of you on this call and others who are not on the call, have worked very hard and tirelessly to address many of the uh, um, issues and um, opportunities for improvement that were raised during that last survey. And to be survey ready while dealing with the pandemic, you've done a lot of great work to help us out. I want to thank all of you for your exceptional work during this challenging time. And now I'd like to pause for just a moment to allow Dr. Uh, Tanvir Hussein, our Chief Quality Officer, and our uh, Associate Chief Medical Officer for the acute facilities, Dr. Felicia Turnabene, uh, to provide a couple of updates on our, our survey readiness efforts. Tanvir and Felicia. Thank you, Del Vecchio. I think you uh, framed it very nicely. Um, you know, it makes me really proud to be a part of an organization where when uh, these findings came out from the Joint Commission, uh, we didn't run away from them, but we ran towards them to really address them. And um, I think it was a week or two ago that Janet very nicely um, was uh, shared the story of how um, people really own their, their spaces and, and, and where they provide care with tremendous pride, completely sort of revitalizing it. And I have to testify that when myself or the quality team have been rounding, there's this uh, great momentum and spirit um, to try to transform, take this opportunity to see how we can transform um, not only our space, but the way that care is delivered. And I think um, the only way that that can happen is when we have you know, uh, the courage to accept what we need to do better um, and then be really transparent um, about what we need in terms of um, support and um, uh, and, and tools to try to make that transformation and, and that culture of transparency with each other, uh, with our other teams that we work with and with our leaders is what helps drive improvement. So I just wanna take this moment um, on behalf of the quality department to recognize our frontline staff, their managers, their directors and the leaders on this call to help really support that transformation. Um, and uh, just be rest assured that, uh, um, that it's not just what we are, um, uh, sort of feeling and seeing, but uh, we actually have um, uh, the leaders in the organization, many of the managers and the directors working with you, take a very quantitative approach to make sure that we're making progress. So uh, for example, some of the uh, mechanisms we have in place to make sure we're making progress um, is that one, for all the plans of correction that were submitted, we have very specific checklists of the evidence that we need to collect, uh, something like 300 items, items um, which will be accumulated in a series of binders. and. Um, uh, the recent numbers are up to 80%, so we're very close. Um, as well, when we look at, uh, there's a standard uh, survey readiness checklist that all of you are using with the quality team, um, and, and we're continuing to see performance on this uh, readiness increase in the area of 80 to 90%. Um, and then there's a monitoring dashboard that, um, that you and us, we all do to audit our practices to make sure that we can sustain our efforts. So tremendous work, a tremendous progress. Um, and we also, uh, I just want to take the moment to also say that uh, coming from a place of humility, uh, we don't want to rest on the progress we've made, but also just constantly remain vigilant that we can sustain that success um, and really hardwired it into our practices. Um, and I encourage each of us that um, if you're beginning to find uh, things are slipping, um, in that sort of spirit of, of uh, putting quality and safety and each other first, let's, let's bring it up. Let's, ha let's feel safe to speak about it and also problem solve around how we put in the sustainable measures um, um, to make things safe. So um, you all have uh, uh, not only provided care during COVID and, and, and had to um, deal with that, but, um, but uh, thank you so much for everything you're doing to also address some of the fundamental practices of quality and safety and keep it up um, with your persistence. I think um, um, we're becoming a better organization. Thank you so much, Tabir. Uh, Dr. Sonamita, do you have anything you'd like to uh, add as well? Um, uh, more just echoing the immense gratitude about the enormous uh, um, amount of work that has gone on um, through, by all leaders, all staff, and making us ready because ultimately it's our preoccupation with this that makes our patients safer and our quality of care better. Um, and so I know that the Joint Commission uh, has told us that part of um, being a reliable organization is this preoccupation with failure. And I, and I so appreciate all the leaders that are out there um, looking for where we can fail and fixing it before we get there. Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, very, very well stated, both of you. And I want to uh, just briefly underscore that. I, I, I think that really, you know, just our, our, we had a board retreat this past weekend, and that was a very, um, 
uh, um, uh, integral part of that discussion and that, that, that convening to talk about how we uh, ensure high reliability as an organization, how we are uh, c persistently focused on quality. And I want to add my thanks to uh, the two of you for your leadership, but as well to the staff and the leaders uh, throughout the organization who are doing all the, the, the tough work of ensuring that we are preoccupied with, with failure and taking all the steps that we need to take to one, demonstrate our, our, um, our ability to provide uh, for a safe um, uh, and uh, high quality caring environment and experience for our patients and for each other. And your, your ongoing commitment to ensuring that we, we keep that up, uh, not just for any survey, we, that's not why we do it. The survey is just a demonstration of what we do all the time. So, so thank you so much for your commitment to doing that. Um, I know oftentimes uh, it can seem, we talk a lot about sometimes these things can seem like they're just uh, additional tasks that you have to do, but it is so very, very vitally important that, that we resist any sort of inclination that that's what we're doing here, that we are absolutely uh, ensuring that quality and that safety for our patients and for our, our colleagues is our top priority and that and, and the why behind all this stuff is, is, is that, is just that. So thank you for doing it. Thank you for continuing to demonstrate compliance. Thank you for continuing to get us there because while 80 and 90% sounds great, it's not what we are about. We, we want to get to 100. So let's make sure that we're checking those crash cards. Let's make sure that our sterile processes are, are um, uh, reliable in our clinics and in our, um, um, our perioperative areas. Let's make sure that we're dealing with areas of cleanliness and our workflows are consistent with the best guidance for infection prevention and for safety for our patients. So thank you so much for all you've done. Thank you for continuing to do that. Along those lines as well, I want to introduce a new guest to our panel, our Chief Compliance Officer, Rick Kibler, who many of you know. Uh, Rick will offer a few words about additional steps that we can take to ensure that we're providing a safer environment uh, for our staff and for our patients. Rick. Hello, and thanks for having me on the uh, panel today. Uh, so yesterday, or Tuesday at uh, ELT, we were talking about compliance reporting, and I was asked, how, when was the last time I communicated to uh, all staff? And I said, well, gosh, I never had the opportunity to do that. Uh, so I was quickly invited to come on this panel and talk. And I wanted to talk for a few minutes about uh, reporting compliance issues to uh, the compliance hotline. And, you know, right now I get about 30 uh, issues reported a month, so one per day, and that's a lot of issues. Uh, some of those are re repeat issues, and some of those are issues that probably could be worked by local management. So I just wanted to uh, talk about that for a minute first. So if you go to your manager first, then they might be able to address your concern. You're having a problem with a coworker, you're having a problem uh, at work, you know, with another area, they might be able to address that. But if you don't feel comfortable about that, that's, when you can report it to me. The hotline is really set up for anonymous reporting. Uh, so if you feel like you uh, don't want your identity known because uh, there would be reprisals against you, that's when you report to me or through the hotline. Now, we do have a policy about non-retaliation, non-retribution. Uh, so you shouldn't have those kind of issues when you report something to your management. But uh, again, that's why we have the compliance hotline to make sure that you can report with confidence that something's going to be done about it. Uh, I do record all issues that are reported to me. Uh, we track all issues to make sure that they get resolved and some of these issues take longer than others. Uh, and if they're personnel issues, you might not always get the feedback that you want to know that something's been done about your concern. Uh, you know, of course, if somebody is terminated as a result, uh, you know something happened. If somebody is not terminated and the issue is addressed with them, you're not gonna get that feedback. Hopefully you see different behavior. Uh, you don't have those issues going forward, but uh, if you do, you need to report something again. Uh, 
what I'm trying to say here is that you have to wait a while based on the number of issues. It's not going to be instantaneous. If it's an HR issue, I'm referring it to HR. They're going to work it. If it's a safety issue, I'm, I'm sending it over to the safety department to risk and let them work it. Uh, so we wanna make sure that the people that are working these issues have the expertise to do that. And we will try to address every issue and we will get back to you when we can to let you know the outcome. If we can't, then hopefully you see it through observation. Okay, so if you have questions about anything, feel free to ask. Uh, I'd be happy to address everything that you ask here. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, and and, and um, appreciate all the work uh, that you and your team do to support our, uh, our workforce and making sure that we have a safe and a responsive um, um, uh, work environment uh, and, a, and a conducive work environment. Uh, just to underscore some of those points, I think that the, the biggest point that Rick and I, and I think our board uh, would like to underscore for all of the members of our teams are that um, when there are concerns and concerns invariably uh, rise in the workplace, we want to resolve them as quickly as possible and in the most expedi uh, expeditious uh, manner possible. So uh, while uh, we have um, uh, various mechanisms for people to re uh, report uh, concerns, uh, we want to make sure that you're using those uh, as um, as appropriately as possible so that you can get a timely and a sufficient response. So uh, we strongly encourage uh, working with local management so that uh, he or she can help to uh, provide uh, a timely uh, resolution to a matter and to work with all parties involved. Uh, we also do want to encourage you to use a hotline when uh, that mechanism for, uh, for one reason or another uh, is not available to you. But uh, we encourage you to use the others uh, um, first if they are available to you. When you use the hotline, uh, uh, because it's for anonymous purposes, um, uh, you, you might experience some impediments to uh, the follow-up to you because of the uh, anonym anonymous nature or anonymous, I should say, uh, nature of your um, of your reporting. And so I ask that you take that into consideration in addition to, as Rick mentioned, uh, process the uh, time-based um, um, uh, process uh, actions that need to occur in order to uh, follow up on, look into, and provide a resolution to whatever matter you want. But at the end of the day, or that you've raised, at the end of the day, we wanna make sure that uh, we are promoting a safe and a uh, um, uh, conducive work environment. So we encourage you to raise concerns uh, and to um, uh, help us to resolve those concerns or, or address those concerns as quickly as possible. Thank you, Rick. And, so uh, one, one more comment, Tavakia, based sure. on what you just said. Uh, if you do report to the hotline, I need as much information as you can provide about the issue at hand. If you tell me that Jimmy processed a claim inappropriately, sometime. It doesn't give me much to go on. I have to go back and identify all the claims over a long period of time and look at everyone. It's going to take me months to, to come up with any uh, solution or resolution to the uh, issue. But if you tell me on a certain day that something happened and here's the details out of it, here's the MRN number or something like that, it it helps me identify what the issue really is, and then I can resolve it quickly. Thank, thank you, Rick. Uh, so I'll uh, move along two other uh, areas here before I uh, wrap up and turn us over to our Q&A. So uh, I've, several of you have inquired uh, understandably uh, about the fiscal impact of COVID-19 on our organization and the potential implications for uh, future cost containment efforts. Um, this is still developing, as you might imagine, because we're in the midst of the, uh, uh, still in the midst of the response and the recovery efforts. Um, but um, I want to share that we did discuss this matter with our board during last week's uh, quarterly retreat. Um, I want to share also uh, from the, on behalf of the board that we are deeply sensitive to uh, the totality of the needs of our organization and our community. The board is very appreciative to all of the staff for all of your uh, hard work and your dedication to our community and our organization during this time. Um, Understandable also though, the board recognizes that like us, several organizations in our, in our uh, market as well as around the country are experiencing um, uh, similar um, uh, challenges and are implementing uh, various cost containment measures, whether they're personnel related or non-HR related. Uh, we have still as of yet not made any determinations to have any 
um, take any actions as it relates to uh, the ongoing uh, clarity around the fiscal impact of COVID-19. However, the board has requested that the administration work with them and to begin to identify uh, potential options that, that um, uh, the board might consider should that come to pass, um, particularly during our budgeting process. Um, they asked also that we remind the organization that we have uh, encouraged in the past and continue to encourage you to uh, raise any opportunities for um, uh, value-based improvements that we may have in the organization that we can implement. So, and many of you have done that, and I want to thank you for those of you who have in your areas. So, if you are identifying whether there is some potential for uh, saving on the uh, burn rate or utilization of various supplies, or the use of alternatives that will maintain quality but perhaps save money, or changes to processes that otherwise have positive impacts on uh, optimizing the use of staff or other sorts of things that, that we uh, continue to welcome those ideas, that we ask that you continue to discuss those with your local leaders or directors or leaders at uh, the sites where you work, uh, so that then we can actually uh, begin to explore and vet those ideas and put them into place. The most important thing we wanna do is also always ensure that we are doing everything we can to be uh, supportive of our community and our workforce. Uh, and making sure that we are taking every opportunity we can to be good fiscal stewards of the, uh, the taxpayer dollars that are entrusted to us to serve our community. To that end, I wanna uh, talk about the converse of that, which is community support. Every, every week I have the fortune of sharing with you all uh, with such great humility and, uh, and honor the amount of and, and different types of support that we're getting from the community. Um, yesterday, many of you may have seen the um, uh, Alameda County uh, Sheriff's Office did the color guard, uh, demonstrated their appreciation by playing the national anthem on bagpipes in front of uh, Highland Hospital. That was shared via Facebook and uh, many people were able to share in that experience as well. That's just fantastic. Uh, last week as well, Oakland City Council member uh, Noel Gallo uh, joined the Oakland Police Department, the Fire Department and a couple of local restaurants and participated in a caravan. Uh, uh, that showed appreciation by donating meals to our frontline workers. I know that every day we receive donations, thank you cards, meals uh, from businesses and individuals, and actually some other uh, really cool ones that are in the works now that we hope to be able to share about uh, in, the, in the coming weeks as well. But really uh, uh, thank uh, our neighbors and our uh, fellow um, uh, first responders for their demonstration of support and gratitude for the wonderful work that all of you are doing every day and serving and uh, uh, supporting our community. Finally, as I end always uh, with um, uh, uh, self-care and wellness, I, I want to say this past weekend's activities in our parks and our beaches and, and other public uh, places, uh, it's a little bit concerning. Uh, uh, I don't know if many of you participated in it, but uh, I know that you know this has been a tough time for all of us. But uh, as shelter in place restrictions are easing and more and more people are out about and enjoying the warm weather, I just wanna encourage you all to continue to stay the course and continue to stay um, as safe as possible. As I mentioned earlier, we know that the virus hasn't gone away and we continue to see positive, um, uh, positive patients in our facilities, as well as the growth in the number of positive patients in our communities. Uh, please remember to mask uh, as, as much as possible to exercise social distancing or personal distancing, I should say, staying six feet apart when you can. Uh, continue to wash your hands often and take care of yourselves and your loved ones. Our Wellness Wednesday message today is, you can't pour from an empty cup. And it reminds us to stop and practice paying attention to our own needs. Uh, be sure to take a look at this tip on our internet. And with that, I'll turn it over to Terry and we can uh, move into the Q&A. Terry. Thank you, Devecchio, for your remarks. Also, Rick and Felicia and Tandre as well for those uh, uh, expansive comments around these particular issues we're talking about today. Uh, just a reminder for folks who may have joined after we started, um, please click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen if you have questions that you would like to have the panelists addressed. We will try to get to those. Um, throughout the remaining portion of our time uh, with you. Um, I wanted to, since we have Rick here in his first time out, uh, have, uh, address another question to him around compliance. And Rick, I guess the question is, uh, there's two questions. Um, one, um, is there any distinction between uh, protective health information for a non-employee or an employee, question number one, and two, if an employee has a question about uh, the, their concern about their 
um, protected health information being accessed, how might they go about uh, raising that question appropriately? Okay, so to answer your question, there really is no difference uh, for PHI between a patient and an employee. Uh, it's still PHI, same rules uh, are pertaining to each of them. Uh, so we have to protect PHI and we're even uh, going to go to greater lengths on an employee because any employee that comes here as a patient goes under break the glass and their uh, medical information is restricted more so than the average patient. Uh, the second question, what was that again? I think you answered them both. Oh, how might an employee raise a concern if they feel like their PHI has been uh, then, inappropriately addressed or something like that? If they feel that their PHI has been compromised, then they should contact the compliance department. They can do that through the hotline. They can call me direct. They can email compliance at ahs.com or .org, you know. Compliance. It's it's on the uh, uh, email exchange, uh, so they can call, they can write. However, all right. Thank you, uh, Jan. I'm going to direct a question your way, and I think Delvecchio touched on. There's been a significant relaxation of shelter in place, uh, reopening of businesses crowded beaches and more and more people are out and about and they're not all necessarily practicing appropriate um, social distancing. Uh, that being said, have there been any changes in our uh, visitation or screening procedures of patients and staff as a result of this sort of lessening of some of the uh, restrictions that have been put in place? No, so thanks, Terry. At this uh, time, we, we uh, continue to have the same stringent testing that we have uh, uh, had for the last couple of weeks. So all staff that come in have their temperature taken. Uh, when they arrive at the facility, they're asked uh, a series of questions based on have you had a fever, uh, cough, any respiratory issues. Um, and then they, it, you know, if there's an issue, they are advised to, to seek uh, advice from their family uh, physician and then contact employee health. Uh, in terms of visitors, we have continued to limit or almost restrict um, visitors that come in. We've made some exceptions for people uh, under the recommendations of the CDC where, um, you know, if they need to come in and help settle a loved one that otherwise would not settle, uh, or if it's an end of life situation, we've made uh, some, some um, allowances for that based on, uh, you know, coordination ahead of time. Uh, for visitors, we do not uh, take temperatures at all of the sites. Uh, we, again, see such a low volume for patients who are going to the clinic. Um, you know, they are not, scre they're screened at the door, but they don't have a temperature taken until they actually get to the clinic. So um, basically the status quo, we have not made any real changes in the last couple of weeks. Great, thank you. Uh, Tanvir and Felicia, a lot of comments uh, on our uh, Joint Commission readiness. Uh, two questions. Uh, any idea when we might see a survey or surveyors arrive on scene? And you talked about being at 80%. Uh, what areas might we be focusing on to get from 80 to 100%? Felicia, I'll get us started. I'm sure you'll have comments to add to. So um, okay. when we last had this conversation, um, the Joint Commission at that time had issued a statement that uh, for the foreseeable future that uh, surveys were going to be um, uh, postponed and actually just this morning the Joint Commission sent out official um, statements saying that they're going to resume surveys um, in June in order of priorities. Uh, they will be connecting um, with facilities sort of indirectly to understand what the relaxations are around uh, shelter in place. Um, uh, but uh, we do expect them and, and we should be preparing as if they're going to arrive on, on June 1st. Um, in the statement, they did talk about how they will modify some of their surveying strategy to try to reduce the number of people in any one room, about how they will try to use some teleconferencing uh, strategies for some of the sessions they typically hold. But of course, there's no substitute for uh, going and getting out on the floors and, and seeing and doing tracers. Um, with that said, they will also follow uh, our protocols around PPE. 
Um, uh, they haven't commented on whether or not they'd go into uh, the you know, uh, procedures or rooms of COVID patients, but they did mention that they will generally be paying attention to um, infection control practices around um, how we're handling COVID patients in addition to the areas that were found on our survey. Um, so with that said, uh, sort of now transitioning to the second point about where do we have areas of opportunity. So, um, you know, uh, the most common areas that organizations get cited for are environment of care um, and infection control. And those are two areas that we were cited for. Um, and um, in the environment of care, um, continue to do what we all are doing, which is really take a pride in your environment. If you see something um, that shouldn't be where uh, something is placed where it shouldn't be or something looks messy or dirty or uh, uh, please clean it up um, or, or get the necessary help to correct it. Um, and um, so just making sure we're vigilant about keeping um, sterile spaces sterile is gonna be really key. Um, and then um, hand hygiene, of course, will be looked at in appropriate use of PPE. Um, then um, uh, uh, in terms of our uh, areas that I would uh, say that where I think we can all collaborate on. Number one, um, when you see equipment um, that's not in the places where it should be, or if the preventative maintenance on equipment is not up to date, please uh, escalate that to make sure that um, that gets addressed. Uh, we have to get work together as a team to make sure these issues are, are addressed. Secondly, um, uh, suicide risk assessment is, an, is a keen focus of the Joint Commission, one of the areas where we had some opportunities. So be um, vigilant um, uh, in taking the opportunity to document the care that you're delivering. I have trust and faith that we are all um, being vigilant and actually exercising uh, a prop appropriate risk assessments and making sure patients have one-to-one -one, um, where appropriate. Um, and you're asking questions about risk factors, um, uh, take the time uh, to, to, to document it because when the Joint Commission comes and surveys, they look at the documentation. Um, and if you're having any challenges with that, please escalate that. Um, the third is around um, our uh, uh, processing of sterile equipment. Um, there's been a lot of, in high-level disinfection, there's been a lot of work done um, in our, uh, with our sterile processing uh, department, um, as well as the areas where um, uh, those procedures occur for high-level disinfection and sterilization. So we'll need, uh, and all the leaders are working with them to make sure that those places um, are, are maintained. Um, those are the key uh, things that come to my mind. Oh, and I shouldn't forget this. A crash cart, uh, Del Vecchio mentioned this. Um, Crash carts, uh, recall, are, are the maintenance of those are, are their life-saving devices, and you never know when you're going to need them, and we always have to be ready for their use. So um, uh, uh, I implore you um, um, to try to make sure we stay on top of that um, and make sure the documentation is there. Um, and broadly, going back to, um, as Del Vecchio and Felicia um, have said, um, it is um, doing exactly what we're doing, which is remaining preoccupied by what is that risk that could eventually reach the patient and working together as a team to try to uh, respond to it as quickly as possible. That's the culture uh, we're creating and, and the one that will make sure that we stay continually um, um, prepared. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to just add also to all of what uh, Tom Veer just said is to also uh, remember that we need to be using our interpretation devices for whenever we either consent a patient or have a visit in in the language of the in the preferred language of the patient. That's just a key item, and and so you know that's the standard process. But um, all consents need to be consented in that patient's language, and it's something to always consider. Great, thank you both. Uh, Tony, uh, just uh, re to, to revisit our conversation from last week, there's a lot of conversation about where we were or what we're considering doing in terms of folks' uh, ability to continue to work remotely. Can you give us an update on uh, what steps we're taking in that process right now and uh, what are some of the things that are, taking, that are being taken into consideration to decide how that rolls out? Thanks, Terry. So it's, it's a great question, uh, and I understand that employees want to know more about this. We're currently assessing every position that is currently working remotely, and also every position that could have been con potentially considered to work remotely. So we're looking at it in a holistic fashion. I think the opportunity of COVID-19 is it's taught us some things about what we're capable of, 
on the telemedicine side, that's the care delivery side, we learned that we could stand that up quickly and treat patients through devices in a manner that is in many regards helpful to them, that they don't have to go through the challenges of traveling to a clinic with difficult parking. The same is true for our employees. The Bay Area is difficult to commute in. There are all kinds of challenges, be it public transportation or on the road. So we're assessing our ability right now to sustain uh, some, if not all, of the positions that are working remotely and then looking at additional positions as well. I think there are a few things that we're looking at that are really granular and would be boring to most people, uh, but are really factual things we have to deal with. What are the consequences for workers' compensation uh, when we have a lot of people working at home in a non-managed, non-ergonomically uh, assessed environment? The ergonomic assessment itself, how do we ensure that people are able to work in an effective fashion for a prolonged period of time? So I have no doubt that we've had some employees working at the dining table, working in areas that are not the same as an office space. That's not their fault. We were pushed into the situation. So we've got to assess, can they maintain a workstation for a long period of time and do so in a, in a way that doesn't bring some physical harm to them? Uh, we've got to ramp up training around HIPAA and other privacy concerns. A lot of people were sheltering in place. Uh, we moved to that quickly. They're in a place they may have access to uh, patient data. We've got to be sure that everyone's very clear of the need to manage that data as they would in the workplace in a home environment that is not set up in the same way a work environment is. The only people around your work are employees for the most part. Uh, and there are a number of other considerations we're looking at. So where we initially uh, stepped out into this space was to working with the managers and they were making an assessment. We're making a broader assessment right now to see what is it we can sustain, uh, both from a work perspective and then from a technological perspective to maintain support for all those people. Uh, we have a number of questions over you know, a long period of time that I've received and others have received, why can't certain call center-based employees work from home? Because telephonically standing that up is not as simple as it may seem. And we've got to make sure the patients can get their calls responded to in a timely fashion. And so all of these elements are being assessed right now to see what we can continue and what we can build on. Uh, and so the, the restoration committee is looking in that and we're looking at it from a HR perspective, insurance perspective and policy perspective to support what we decide we can do going forward. We do think there's a lot of opportunity here and we want to capitalize on that and not just go back to the exact way that we worked before because there are things that we've learned here that are really going to help us as an organization. Great, thank you, Tony. Uh, just one quick follow-up question. Do you have a sense of a timeline of where there might be a uh, policy rolled out around this or uh, a plan revealed? Yeah, I, I, thanks, sir. I, as I speak to you now, the answer is no. I've got to build that and work with the Restoration Committee on it. There are some complexities, some complexities to this in our environment. We have 18 different collective bargaining units and we moved quickly to have people who were unrepresented, who had always been covered by this policy, and then waive some provisions uh, specifically for the represented staff. Obviously, we'd have to go back and address that with the, with the various unions. I don't want to presume anything in that regard. Uh, we need to work with our labor partners to ensure that what we do is okay for all our employees and for the various labor unions. Uh, so we're going to have to work through that level of detail. So I don't have one right now. I'll try and have one next week when we're on this call so we're clear and we can communicate effectively on that because I do know it's a, a matter of concern for people. Great. Thank you. Uh, I know that when Tanvir and Felicia talked about the number of people who are involved in our preparation for a joint commission and Janet talked about the need for everyone to take accountability as we look at our supplies and addressing issues that may be coming up, uh, there's a question about how our C-suite executives are rounding in patient care areas, whether it's regarding preparation for joint commission or other factors that uh, are facing the organization right now. Love to hear from you guys on the level of rounding that you may be doing individually and also what have been your sort of perceptions, experiences as you've gone around talking to staff and what you've what sort of stood out to you as you've been going through that process? So maybe I'll start oh. with the, the, the biggest C-suite person, Mr. Finley. I don't know about all that, but uh, <laughs> I, as, as I am fond and truly believe, uh, a, a saying and truly believe, I, I work for all of you. Um, 
So yeah, let me just say at a high level and then uh, I'll, I'll offer um, uh, for the other um, um, uh, folks who want to chime in here to, to add to it. Um, so yeah, we have uh, a lot of our uh, uh, members of the executive leadership team or C-suite executives as uh, we refer, uh, participating in a, 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 a various array of rounding opportunities. Uh, our largest sort of um, a contingent of uh, the ELT who are doing this are our chief administrative officers and our associate chief medical officer and our chief quality officer with his team. So uh, those individuals are, whether it's in the acute side of the house or the uh, post-acute side of the house, so I'm talking about Janet and Richard and Paula and uh, Felicia are really leading the way with working with the VPs and the directors and the managers with rounding on areas, making sure that they are rounding on areas with um, uh, uh, the right amount of frequency and ensuring not just the survey readiness and compliance with our um, uh, with our standards for uh, um, uh, conditions of participation, but also just general safety practices, general employee engagement practices, and and and, and the like, as well as. Uh, issues that may arise. So, so that is that's our kind of front line of our leadership team that is actually uh, uh, steering our, our rounding efforts. But in addition to that, uh, other members of our leadership team uh, participate in rounding too. So, our, our our sort of operational dyad is our chief medical officer and our chief operating officer, and they participate in uh, rounding um, um, whether um, at the various sites um, uh, with. Um, some of the leaders or themselves are participating in rounding efforts. And then uh, I will be um, um, sadly honest that a, a vast amount of my uh, efforts in the last couple of weeks have been uh, exclusively concentrated here at the Highland campus in, in and outpatient uh, parts of the, uh, um, the, the operations here. But uh, I look forward to and uh, welcome the opportunity for when I can get back to some of our other acute sites, our post-acute sites, as well as our uh, ambulatory sites uh, in the coming uh, days and weeks uh, for the organization. But that is the, the vast majority of how our C-suite executives have been participating. I want to acknowledge uh, some of our other leaders uh, um, in terms of uh, our head of HR and IT and pop health and a couple of other areas who have also been complementing uh, those diet rounds uh, by doing uh, more spot rounds, uh, largely through the lens of their areas, but also uh, working with those executives to see how they can support our um, uh, pandemic response efforts our ongoing survey readiness and the like. But that's, that's mainly what we're doing. Obviously, uh, um, with that type of frequency, you will certainly, uh, um, there will be points where you may not see us as much as you see other executives, particularly giving a 24-hour operation in uh, many uh, parts of our organization, 24-7 uh, for that matter. So, But that's how we're participating. You do see us. If I want to add to just a proactive thing, and we've said it on this call, people want us to specifically come to staff meetings or huddles uh, to speak with you directly about any any of these items or to hear from you uh, please do invite us actually work with your, your your leadership and invite us we'd love to make sure we're coordinating the timing where we can uh, be able to engage with you and work with you and make sure you understand that we're here to support you and even when we're not with you we're working to support you by uh, looking at some of the things that we're doing for restoration expansion of testing uh, partnering with our community partners in the county on contact tracing uh, survey readiness and interacting with regulatory bodies and a host of other things. I don't know if the others want to add to that. Uh, just to add that uh, rounding is, is certainly one of my favorite parts of my day. That's where I, I get to get out and see um, uh, everyone out in the organization. Uh, uh, Janet and I um, try and do it together when we can. That's indeed our goal is to always do it together as partners. But um, when we're at different parts of the um, organization on different days, we just uh, do it on our own. And, and um, I find it absolutely delightful to um, say hi to people, to uh, see how things are, are going. And, and frankly, it just helps keep me grounded um, uh, as to the reason uh, why um, I, I'm here every day, which is to support the patients and the staff. Yeah, I'll just um, add that uh, I think um, in addition to sort of the clinical rounds that some of us on the executive team have the privilege of, of being able to do when we're on service, um, we often do see things through different lenses, sort of when we're doing patient experience rounds or quality safety rounds. But I will tell you that I think um, the, uh, the part that's most satisfying to me is actually being able to spend time with the remarkable teams that we have 
in our hospitals because it just it's, it's invigorating uh, to interact with you um, and that that's what gives me and I and I can I know I speak on behalf of my colleagues gives us tremendous joy uh, to be at an organization uh, working with you um, uh, so it's not work for us it is in fact um, one of our sources of, of true of, of, of joy yeah, just a, a quick tag on that. I, I, you know, I think we hear it every time a regulatory body comes in and rounds how friendly our staff is, how approachable they are, how collaborative they are. Uh, I think we feel that as well as leaders. I commend everyone for their fearlessness and their braveness uh, just in speaking up and not being afraid to come to us and say, hey, this is broken or if you could do this, this would help us. Um, that's not always an easy thing to do. And so I, I, I thank you for that. Um, it's not something I ever relished as a staff nurse. In fact, I worked nights on purpose, so I didn't interact with administration. And so um, I know how hard that is to speak up and ask for something. Um, and again, I commend everybody for doing that. You make us feel welcome, but you also make it uh, worthwhile for us to round. Uh, so it's not just passing hay in the hallway and moving on. It's actually value added. So thank you for that. All right. So uh, just one other wrap up question as we're getting close to the hour. Um, Devecca, you talked a little bit about the budget situation that we're approaching. Um, any sense of um, what you might be looking for for folks to bring forward in terms of thoughts or ideas about uh, how to uh, bring forward ideas on how we might wanna address uh, looking at efficiencies, managing expenses, or other ideas to sort of set the foundation for uh, this important conversation that's ahead of us. Yeah, th thank you. Um, uh, perhaps not more than uh, what I what I tried to set out at the beginning, but let me just say all options are on the table as far as we're concerned. Um, uh, we recognize that you will, uh, depending on where you are in the organization, where you sit, what type of uh, um, um, lens you have into finances, what types of uh, uh, accountabilities you have into uh, um, uh, understanding what expenses are or what your part of the uh, operations look like in terms of the services, whether you're in post-acute or in perioperative or in uh, uh, outpatient or other areas, you, you, your, the likelihood is that your ideas or thoughts will, will be informed by what you can see. But what you can see is incredibly valuable because your lens is different than the rest of ours. And so uh, not every idea, and this won't surprise anybody, turns up to materialize into anything that's actually um, uh, uh, perhaps workable, but it doesn't, it shouldn't stop you from suggesting it. Uh, it at least gives us the ability to say, great idea, we've looked into it. Uh, uh, ideally, or hopefully it will say, that's something we can do. Um, we have board members who are fun of saying, you know, $5,000, Several five thousand dollars add to tens of thousand dollars, add to hundred thousand dollars, and and you and and it snowballs from there and there. So so uh, not every idea will lend itself to a uh, uh, a um, workable solution. Sometimes it takes time to do these things. Sometimes it's actually there's no there, the juice is not worth the squeeze, as they say. Uh, but uh, many times uh, it may be. And the ultimate uh, point here is is anything you think of is worth this suggestion. And, uh, and, and, and let us take it from there uh, to work with you and work with others to see if there's any prospect there. Okay, great. So um, I, there's a, there was a question about ED volumes and how we're gonna communicate with folks about uh, feeling more comfortable coming back into the facility, whether it be for emergency care or uh, other types of services uh, when that might happen. Uh, I'd like to add that in working with the Restoration uh, Oversight Committee, we are uh, looking at uh, restorational services. We're looking at a communication that would broadly go out to our patients, uh, possibly as soon as next week, reiterating uh, that emergencies don't take a break, even during a pandemic, so that folks should still feel comfortable uh, coming to us for emergency services and that we've done a number of things to make sure that we're prepared to provide emergency services to protect both our patients and staff. So uh, communication around that uh, respect will probably be going out uh, in the following week. And there will also be more specific uh, communications that will go out as different departments and services are ramped up. Wanna make sure we don't get out ahead of that process uh, right now, but uh, look forward to uh, that type of communication being sent to patients and also shared with staff uh, in the next week or so. So with that, uh, Devecchio, any last words you'd like to share with the uh, 
uh, the group before we, we adjourn? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Terry. Uh, as always, I like to, to, to thank my fellow uh, panelists uh, here. You guys are, as, uh, um, are, are, are always a wealth of uh, very helpful and knowledgeable insights and information uh, that I think uh, uh, really help uh, folks to understand where we are as an organization and, and how we need to continue to proceed to make sure that we are uh, supplying oh. Whoops. Um, <laughs> Doing all sorts of stuff today. I triggered the alarm uh, for security, so sorry about that, folks. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, what a day. Uh, thank you for everything you continue to do, support our patients and each other. Remember to stay safe. Uh, remember to, um, uh, that we are still in the midst of the pandemic. There is no uh, vaccine yet, and so uh, we need to lead by example, and it's very important, particularly in our community. That's the last thing I'll end with. Uh, there's a lot of thoughts that, uh, similar to the Spanish flu, that oftentimes that second wave can have its heaviest impact on uh, marginalized communities, uh, and uh, so uh, that is a, a broad core of the, uh, or swath of the community that we serve, and we want to do everything we can to make sure we're safe and here to serve them, but also that we're doing everything we can to ensure that we are not um, um, uh, um, uh, contributing to that in any way. So both in your professional walk here with us, but also in your personal lives, I strongly encourage you to continue doing all the right things that you've done to keep yourself safe and our community safe. Thank you, Del Vecchio. Uh, for our panelists, thank you as well. Uh, other participants, uh, if you didn't hear all the complete uh, presentation, uh, be reminded that uh, these chats are posted uh, on the intranet uh, for you to review uh, or take a look at later on. If you have members of your team who can't make the one o'clock uh, session on a regular basis, they can go back. Those meetings are archived um, for, for you to go back and uh, hear questions and comments that were presented in the past. So thank you all again for attending. Uh, be well, stay safe. Thank you.